kind of an interesting um, sort of lens that we get to use today um, and go a lot deeper than a lot of similar conversations. Um, so really looking forward um, for everyone who could join. Um, if it's okay, because we've got a lot to talk about and I'm imagining a lot of questions and dialogue will come out of this, um, I'm just gonna get started. Um, if you wanna read a little bit more about DCRCC or my background, feel free to check out our website um, or email me personally. Um, you can see that in the slides when they get shared. Um, so the sort of the idea of today's workshop is um, it's important that we get some shared language um, out of the way. Um, I know that um, it can be very um, emotionally charged when you start talking about violence against children and youth. Um, so I want to be really transparent about where I'm coming from and where information is coming from. Um, understanding that different environments look at some of these conversations in very different ways. Um, so the natural place to start is really just to begin by defining power um, as it's relevant to thinking about relationship types um, and what that means for how people are able to advocate for themselves in those types of uh, relationships. Um, so in a very general way, if we were imagining that we were in a room together and doing kind of a group think, um, some, some aspects of power that might come out of that brainstorm are thinking about Okay, so what, how is power distributed, right? What gives you power in different spaces? What are the goals? What, um, what do we like believe in different environments compared to others? Um, how do you gain it? How do you lose it? How do you use power? Um, and kind of for what purpose, right? Um, that's kind of this context of power in terms of a resource that we all have access to. Um, for the purpose of our conversation, we really frame power in a few different types um, of structures, right? And all of that has to do with how is power distributed and how do you gain power in that type of relationship? Um, this is not a model that's unique to DCRCC. Um, it was introduced to me and a lot of nonviolent organizing spaces, um, but certainly a lot of other fields look at power this way as well. Um, so a power over relationship is quite simply just power is not equally distributed. Someone in that relationship has more control and decision making power than someone else. This is sort of contrasted with a power with relationship, which is predicated on the idea that it's shared equally amongst everyone within that relationship so that decision-making requires consensus. Power within is kind of from this idea that as people, we are naturally able to do things just by being alive and that those kind of go beyond sort of societal power arrangements that have meaning based on what we decide has meaning. Um, so things like clarity of vision, charisma, different sort of abilities that you have, we are still considering that as a form of power. What's important is that when we're talking about these theoretically, we can describe them as if they're completely separate. But if you're looking in terms of how they're used in our day-to-day -day experiences, they're, they're always sort of coming in and out of each other, right? So what we believe we have the power to do is very much informed by how power has been used on us, what types of relationships have the most meaning in our day to day. Um, and for the most part, we pay attention to what we don't have power and control over even more than what we do have power over. But those are um, very influential in our understanding, um, which is really important because we're talking about trauma. Um, and so you can make an assumption that the young people that you would be working with have had at least an experience of power being sort of taken away from them in a way that maybe has left them distrustful, um, maybe has sort of um, changed some of their beliefs about your intentions or what they have control over. 
Um, and so all of that is kind of this context and residue that is already sort of at play before we even get to a place where advocacy um, is sort of underway. I am seeing, um, excuse me, as I change the slide. Um, beyond thinking of power sort of in these different categories, it's also important that they kind of change what we expect from those relationships. So if you're thinking about what boundaries and boundaries being crossed look like, if you're thinking about um, how you approach sharing information or what creates trust between the people involved, that's where the sort of power arrangements become really relevant because the rules are different in different types of relationships. If I am determining sharing something with my boss versus my oldest friend, right, I might use very different language. There might be very different consequences that come from sharing different types of information. And I might feel differently sort of at liberty to kind of um, draw boundaries with my friend than I would my boss. Um, and so all of that is important in kind of, again, going back to this difference between being an adult survivor versus being a minor. Um, and so some relationships are really obvious what category they fit into, um, and others are not, right? Like a waitress and a customer, we might not know how to group that, um, but some clues that we can think about are like who gets to make decisions, who decides consequences, um, and who controls information that all three of those areas can be um, sort of, there can be power associated with all three of those. Um, and they might not all fall to one party, um, but those are things to be paying attention to. So a word that I haven't spoken about yet um, that comes up on this slide is this idea of safety. Um, and if you think about it in terms of relationship, what creates safety, and you think about what it means when power and control have been um, used violently, safety is kind of this very murky term. And I would argue that safety, um, even if you haven't experienced violence, is a very murky term for, for children and youth, um, because often their priorities and their understandings of safety are not the same as adults. Um, and so sometimes there's a tension even at sort of their definitions and criteria for developing safety compared to us. Um, a big part of that has to do with, again, this idea of rule setting, this idea of what have other people, maybe in my peer group, what have, their, what have been their experiences of navigating an institution or a person um, and how does that sort of drive my perception of what control I have in that relationship? Um, that you might really see this in terms of um, not only do, um, whether youth survivors decide to engage services at all, but also how much information they're willing to provide to advocates. So that was pretty theoretical, um, and obviously that applies to more than just advocacy. Um, but some things I just want to highlight, because a lot of the tone of this PowerPoint is about um, sort of offering you reflection questions that you can take back to your organization and think about more individually. Um, it's really important to be thinking about what are the situations where youth survivors are in power with relationships versus power over. Um, and as an advocate, how am I thinking about my relationship with them in sort of this power over category, right? Um, and using that to think about what does accountability to that sort of greater amount of power in that relationship mean for me and mean for them. So, the sort of other complicated variable when you start talking about power is thinking about how do you include institutions and structures, right? Um, we tend to think of people first when we talk about relationships, 
Um, but for the purpose of this framework, we're also sort of grouping institutions and structures as relationship types. Um, and sort of by default, institutions and structures fall into this category of power over relationships, both as advocates are, uh, are concerned, but also as youth are concerned. So I'm going to um, introduce this next slide, and then I'm going to pause for a minute and sort of see how we're doing, um, if any sort of initial questions are coming up off the bat. Um, so the reason I'm starting by thinking about power um, is in some way to model this idea of informed consent. When someone in an experience or an encounter has more information than the other, that in and of itself is a power dynamic, right? And there's a lot of moments where, as advocates, we have more information than survivors seeking our services. And that's true for adults as much as it is for youth. And one of the ways that we can sort of be accountable to that power dynamic is giving them information up front about what they can expect, about what type of relationship we're in and what that means in terms of how they advocate for themselves or what control they do and don't have. Um, but it starts by kind of acknowledging that two things. Number one, Control of information about yourself is a form of power. And so when you have to access a service by sharing information about yourself, that is sharing power or giving power to the person who you're seeking resources from. With that sort of as, um, as a starting assumption, it's also important to name that um, it's appropriate for me to feel cautious when considering sharing information about myself. And that is as much true if like you're a friend of mine or you're a family member or you're sort of a formal advocate um, who's trying to support me in some way. Um, and often we haven't given information to youth before they're in a position of crisis when they need it. And so they're kind of playing catch up with finding out the information while it has very large implications around their choices, which even more leads to kind of an experience of not feeling trusting and not feeling in control of that situation. Um, and this is really a, like a pretty regular experience. Um, even just thinking about um, with all the stuff happening of sort of shootings in schools, um, schools tend to send emails home to parents to kind of give you status on like what's happening. And, you know, um, I was in a conversation this morning where there was a drill happening where students were kind of sitting in shelter under their desks and their parents knew what was happening more than students who were in that situation actively. And I feel like this is just a, um, a really emblematic example of what's kind of the pecking order of information about you, and often adults are ranked above you. Um, and that is something that youth are pretty familiar with. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a minute. Um, how are we doing so far? Any um, questions or clarification that people are needing? Or anything, Michelle, you wanna highlight from the chat box? Um, let's see. Now, mostly it's like logistical stuff that I'm answering okay. right here. Perfect. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, then I will keep going, um, and I will sort of offer this check-in again um, in a few minutes. So, pivoting from this sort of two terms that we've talked about, informed consent um, and power, the third that's really important kind of as background context as we start to kind of get more into the nuts and bolts of advocacy um, is this term adultism. Um, and this comes out of a youth development framework. So it might be a new term for people. Um, and what it does is describe sort of the cultural attitudes and behaviors that privilege adults over minors. 
um, and what that privilege looks like um, is, is kind of happening in two parts. Number one, it gives adults the ability to gatekeep the consent of minors. And two, it gives, um, it, it determines a difference between sort of what the rights that children and youth should have are compared to adults that creates a privilege of the adult perspective that then is reinforced through all kinds of microaggressions, um, just like lots of other forms of oppression. Um, and so this is different than ageism because it's specific to what's the cultural um, and political meaning of being a minor in a society that sort of creates different rights for children and youth compared to adults. And I, I offer this term not to kind of open up a can of worms about whether that's appropriate or sort of what's the rationale behind that. But if we're being sort of straightforward about how power arrangements work, it's just important for us to be able to name that that difference in distribution of decision-making power creates sort of an ever-present power over relationship between adults and minors. Some of the implications of that um, is that when you're thinking about um, particularly like confidentiality or privacy or what makes me feel unsafe, some of those needs get really exasperated for young people um, because the policies behind them don't necessarily um, give like the same kind of discretion to them as they might adults. So for example, most um, communication between advocates and survivors when you're an adult are, are confidential just sort of from the beginning, whereas because of some of how of our policies work, um, that's not true for minors. Um, and so that's a different fear for them um, just from starting to share information at the beginning. The other things that are important is that just thinking about how you begin to access services, there's not a lot of independent access that you can kind of arrange by yourself. Either you need some kind of documentation or permission by like a guardian, there's some assumed notification of adults, or just the eligibility for accessing them doesn't include your age group. So um, I know we're kind of online, so this is by definition a little less interactive. Um, but I want to invite you to kind of look at your chat boxes um, and just sort of in your own words, think about these three terms, consent, force, and informed consent, um, and just sort of write your first thought. What, what does one or two or three of those words mean to you? Um, and I'm just going to give about a minute if people want to type their answers, um, and I will call out some of the themes that I'm seeing in my chat box. So awesome. I'm seeing agreeing. I'm seeing keeping one's power. I'm seeing lots of words around choice and being willing. I'm seeing that it's ongoing and active. Um, I'm seeing consent and force kind of pitted as opposites. Um, I'm seeing being able to control your own actions, um, and specifically this piece about um, things that affect you. I'm seeing self-determination. I'm seeing that it can be revoked. Um, I'm seeing that it's sort of independently decided, force against will. I really like this distinction that um, I'm seeing about informed consent versus consent, um, and I would have to agree. Informed consent is, is not the same as consent, and it very much has to do with transparency of information and process. Um, and what I would add that even kind of beyond the distinction being um, drawn here in some of these comments, um, that just like informed consent doesn't mean that you have consent, 
having consent in practice often does not mean that you have informed consent. But there's a lot of times where we give people choice without explanation. Um, and so kind of seeing that it works both ways, um, I want to just uplift that. Um, I really like that people are bringing in this idea of how sort of trauma responses um, complicate things in the moment. Wonderful. Um, feel free to keep adding these. Um, I really appreciate your responses. Um, what I think um, is also really useful um, is that none of these definitions are specific to sexual violence. Um, and so really just hearing how much of those words kind of apply to our own behaviors um, and how relevant it is to think of it that way um, when we get into some of the examples of what best practices around advocacy are, um, and we kind of go back to what these three words mean, um, I think it gives us a lot of indicators of what are the moments where, like on a procedural or organizational level, we've gotten a little bit too comfortable with sort of using force in some of our policies or um, being a little too shorthand with our approach to informed consent, um, and how can we use that as some different criteria for evaluating ourselves and our responses. Um, so a big piece of that for me is getting um, more examples of noticing what does non-consent look like in our day-to-day -day interactions, um, and not just in, in relationship with sexual violence, but in our day-to-day -day experiences, how can we do a better job of noticing when somebody's shutting down, when somebody um, isn't being given all the information while they're being asked to make a decision, when they seem uncomfortable, when somebody is ignoring body language um, or sort of um, manipulating a response. Um, and this shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, one way that we practice this a lot um, in our trainings, um, I'm a really big fan of role play. Um, and so these are pictures um, from our advocate training of um, consent skits where um, advocates are asked to think about a day-to-day -day experience um, and to bring in some of these cues of non-consent um, around like a decision being made between people um, so that the group can practice noticing what that looks like. Um, and I would offer that as like a good brainstorm activity within your organization um, to think about how does non-consent show up in advocacy. Um, so to kind of flip that on its head and be more in this strength-based, skill-based um, land, um, I talk about consent in two, two ways when I'm training. I talk about it first as a mindset, um, and then I talk about it as a skill set. Um, and the reason that's important for me is that first, like, we have to be able to think about, like, the attitudes and beliefs we have about consent. And now we have to be able to think about what are the abilities and the skills that I need to be able, be able to act on that. Um, and sometimes we, we talk about like the attitude and belief without thinking about the preparation and support someone would need to be able to apply that new attitude. Um, and especially if we start to think about this in terms of advocacy, um, that is also true for us that you know, we could have a lot of beliefs about what agency and decision-making young people should have. But if we are not in control of, like, the outside context and systemic responses, um, we, we're going to have a hard time reconciling those two things. Um, and so really just thinking about what, what is, like, the relevance of, like, my specific biases, but also what is the, the wider context that I'm a part of or the infrastructure that sort of determines my behavior, um, that's a really good thing for us to be paying attention to. Um, so again, these are some reflection questions for you. Um, 
The big piece, again, is this idea of clear communication, which is hearkening back to informed consent. Um, in terms of thinking of consent as a skill set, um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's something that just gets you started. Um, and from my perspective, all of these are skills that make you able to practice consent, right? The ability to have like your own words for um, drawing boundaries and responding to boundaries being drawn with you. The ability to pivot to, you know, you asked me a lot of things and I'm comfortable with some of them. How do I name that I'm comfortable with some of them, but not all of them? How am I getting better at sort of um, paying attention to like verbal messaging, but also nonverbal messaging, which is really important as we talk more about trauma responses. Um, and also just having some awareness of what your boundaries are um, and having signals of what it looks like for you personally when your boundaries are being crossed or stretched. Um, and a lot of this has to do with sort of emotional awareness and self-awareness, um, as well as like language, um, and that that language really has to exist on both sides um, for the person um, asking for consent and the person trying um, to decide if they're going to give it or not. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, um, but just in terms of having um, and a definition that incorporates a lot of the themes that you put in the chat box, um, right? Consent is about an agreement to do something, um, and it's given freely with a shared understanding of circumstances. Um, and this idea that I and you are on the same page about what's going to happen, I really want to sort of tease out as we get into advocacy around how are we more accountable to letting young people know what is going to happen when they make certain decisions about accessing services, and how are we building that into our responses? Um, and not just how are we building it into our responses, but how are we expecting that that should be built into our responses? Um, the other thing that I would name about this um, we change our definition of consent culturally much faster than we can change it legally. And there's always kind of a discrepancy between what consent means in laws or in policies versus what consent means in different environments or, you know, in different sort of cultural understandings. Um, and so thinking about what consent means to you versus how it might have been introduced to young people and how their expectations of consent or how to script it might be different than ours um, is also important for us to notice. Um, and same with rape culture, that there are a lot of behaviors and norms that they might be experiencing that are not even on our radar, um, or conversely, that they might not be sort of assigning harm or labeling their experiences as violent um, in the ways that we might want them to or that we might be doing um, just sort of unconsciously. So this is a little bit of a pivot, um, but to come sort of back to this idea of why is it relevant to be thinking about the difference of power in different types of relationships. Um, this, um, this is a power and control wheel that is applied to healthy relationships. Um, and I would argue that this is kind of some of the criteria around power with relationships, right? How are we kind of bringing in some of these um, attributes in terms of how we are evaluating how we're doing at sharing power with each other um, and with survivors in particular? Um, and so you can see that, like, respect is in the center, but the things that are built around the respect are a sense of trust, a sense of accountability, a sense of safety, a sense of honesty, a sense of support, and a sense of cooperation. And all of that has to do with, again, how are we communicating? How are we sort of on the same page about what we can expect? 
and what will happen when expectations are breached in some way. Um, and how are we coming at this from a place of, I am able to respect what unsafety means to you that might be different than what it means to me. And I'm able to sort of more slowly um, receive your distrust toward me and toward the process um, that you sort of on this ongoing way are always kind of evaluating, can I take the risk? that that response is going to ask me to take. Um, and that there, I think we tend to have a bias that we want people to like sign up for that experience. Um, but if we're taking consent and informed consent seriously, we also have to be comfortable with young people making informed decisions to opt out of some of our service models um, if they ask them to take more risks than they're comfortable with. Um, and because we, you know, I, I named that um, I'm approaching this conversation as if, as advocates, we are in this power with um, relationship with each other and this power over relationship with survivors, that we really have to kind of be on our P's and Q's about how, we're, how we are at communication and how transparently we're able to kind of explain the processes um, and put decisions back into the hands of the people we're supporting. Um, and then that is kind of where a lot of our accountability is going to come from. This is just another example um, of some of the role play um, that we do with our advocates. Um, except in this context, it's not just thinking about consent. It's also thinking about how some of those trauma responses play out in sort of our, our physical experiences and our community experiences um, and how those things kind of look when they blend together. Um, so why this is in here is also just to remind us to be really creative in the examples we're thinking about um, when we're reflecting on these topics. Um, and in the spirit of supporting kind of um, having these conversations with all ages, um, same thing. These are examples of kind of planting these seeds with really young children about how do you know what giving consent looks like to you and other people? How are you practicing kind of knowing where your boundaries are in different topics? Um, and that those can be really age appropriate, um, but all of that is um, helping us practice so that when we get to these more high stakes examples um, where harm is more a part of, of what happens when we don't get consent right, um, that we've kind of built these skills on top of each other, um, just like we do with all skills, right? That the practice and um, the sort of foundational skills that are in place, um, that we get better at it the more that we have done that kind of in a um, repetitive and reinforced way. Um, so I'm going to pause again because we're about to get into more um, reflection questions about evaluating our response um, and thinking about some of the best practices around advocacy. Um, but before I make that um, sort of larger pivot, I just want to open up again for any questions. Um, anything you want to highlight, Michelle? Um. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I've been monitoring the chat box. There's nothing there, but um, if folks have questions, go ahead and put it there. Let's um, give it a minute for folks to be able to type. Um, okay. All lines are muted, so you can't you can't uh, speak, but you can put uh, your question in the chat box. And everybody should be able to see everybody's comments and questions now. I apologize for not having those um, open. Can you see that question, Amanda? I did. Um, so this is what I was just explaining. Um, this was two activities. We um, facilitate um, a monthly workshop in partnership with our public library um, that we refer to as Art and Movement. Um, and using sort of theater and movement and art-based um, modes, 
um, we do lots of skill building around naming your emotions, around um, practicing with physical and non-physical boundaries. Um, the, the first one um, on your left um, was um, participants listing off ways that they give consent um, with, of course, some added art um, and having that conversation and then practicing the skills that other kids were listing. Um, and the one on the right um, is an activity that we use a lot um, referred to as comfort circles. Um, the smallest circle um, are things that you're really comfortable with. The middle circle are things that kind of stretch you, um, that you, you might want to do, but they feel a little challenging. Um, and the large circle is um, sort of your panic circle, so things that, that you're really uncomfortable with. Um, and so the stickers are kids putting their answers. So I might say a question like, are you comfortable when your teacher calls on you at school? Um, and kids would put a sticker to indicate um, what boundary they have around that example. Um, and the, the picture in the bottom right corner um, is just practicing some of the emotional regulation through tactile things. So that's a sandbox and magnet tiles um, and some drawings. There's another question, Amanda. Can you describe the role plays that you were talking about in the slide 17? I can. Um, so this, um, to build off what I was talking about in terms of um, the consent role plays, um, one of the sort of areas that I prepare people for um, is um, how to serve on our 24-hour hotline. Um, so we do a lot of role plays of actual calls um, and practicing some of the skills of crisis intervention in terms of responding um, to the stated goals and the stated boundaries of callers. Um, and before we get into any of that, we do some very theoretical framing of defining power and defining trauma um, and we, similar to art and movement, um, really try to use a lot of more creative and less verbal um, activities so that people get out of their heads a little bit um, and they can be a little more open-minded um, in how they have those discussions. Um, there is another, there's some questions about mandatory reporting and um, things like that, but I, Mm -hmm. I imagine, Amanda, that we're going to get to that um, in a few more slides, right? Yes. Um, that I will definitely um, get to. Um, and if for whatever reason um, we didn't answer that um, to the extent that you're asking, um, just please type it again um, and we will come back to it. And a couple of people are really interested in your comfort circle activity, if you wouldn't mind sharing it later via email. I sure can. Yeah, no problem. Are we good to move forward? Yeah. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so again, these you're gonna have access to these slides, so you'll be able to see these reflection questions if you want to share them with um, other people on your staff. Um, where I'm a big journaler, so if um, writing some of your thoughts out later is helpful to you, um, feel free to use these. Um, but again, I'm, gonna, um, I'm not going to have you write your answers in the chat box just for the sake of time, um, but I want to just pose this question for you to think about. Um, when you are thinking about the needs of adult survivors, um, what are the first things you think of? Um, and just take a minute. I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds um, and let you think about that. And so some of our stock answers when we think about survivor needs, um, which also really correlate to a lot of our principles as advocates, um, the importance of confidentiality, so control of your information, um, your physical safety needs, um, 
just being believed and validated um, that your experience is um, worth somebody not only believing but placing importance on um, and kind of following up to hear what your goals and um, what you'd like a response to be. Um, and that that really goes into this idea of control return. So how do I give you as many um, opportunities to make decisions for yourself as possible? Um, yep, I'm seeing your answers um, in the chat box. Um, those, um, I love every time people write um, self-determination. So I'm seeing that every time. Um, so this is a very um, straightforward question. Are those needs different for teams? This is one where if we were in person, um, things tend to get a little tense because we start responding based on everything that is true in our laws and policies that reinforce that those are different um, and that change the implications of some of our responses to teens as compared to adults. Um, and so this is not meant to be such a provocative question. Um, it's really meant to allow us to reflect and, and that do we believe that there are some of those soft skills that teens require from advocates in the same way adults do um, and some priorities that they might have that could be consistent. Um, and kind of if you can think of it that way first, then it's easier to kind of separate out from like what's our current response versus what do we believe our response should be or what do we think the impact of our response is. Um, because if we start with what responses we've seen, um, again, like it really kind of um, drains our creativity because we're responding based on what we have seen enacted and we're not thinking about that question um, as if nobody had given us an answer before. Um, so um, again, um, I'm going to just kind of leave that there um, for now. Um, so in the most literal sense, we do not have a lot of diversity in our thinking about child sexual abuse. Our response is very one-size-fits-all. Um, and it is imagining very specific factors that are creating vulnerability of children. And there's not a lot of flexibility on an implementation level to change what that response looks like practically. Um, and so if you just think of it in general, that means we are lumping 18 very different developmental ages into one kind of constant response. Um, and that comes with some pros and cons, right? It's helpful to kind of take a historical um, lens for a second and think about how do we get to a place where this is our response. And some of it came out of an idea to kind of require institutional accountability or to create some liability or some consequences for institutions who are not being compliant with sort of taking experiences of survivors seriously or, um, you know, taking the harm caused seriously. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to diminish those as very valid reasons that helped us get to where we are. Um, I just want to highlight that one of the aspects of our response is that it is very rigid and it does not give you a lot of flexibility and either kind of taking the young person's priorities um, and letting them have more authority than some of our existing policies and being very customized in our responses. Those things are pretty difficult. So again, we're not gonna get heavily into this question, but as you're reflecting and as you're having more conversations within your organization, because I imagine people are coming from very different fields um, and with very different kind of professional experience around these questions. Um, but I do want to just really elevate this question of 
are there things that we expect of kids that we don't expect of adults? Um, and what might be some of our reasons for that? Um, an answer that I might give to this, um, we have given more flexibility for adults than we have with kids to decide if they want police involved. Um, that is an example of a different expectation. So I'm gonna get a little more in the weeds on some of the like child development implications um, for our advocacy. Um, so this might feel like a little bit of a left turn from our questions for a second. Um, so you, I just stated a minute ago about this idea that there are unique developmental experiences between sort of infants and 18 year olds. Um, and obviously human development is something that goes on for our whole lives. Um, but there are some really important developmental milestones that happen kind of in childhood and adolescence. Um, and that is true even before we get into some of these societal implications. Excuse me. And so it's also really important that when we're talking about barriers um, and realities for young people, we have to get really specific um, because there are a lot of things to know um, and a lot of different players that are involved. Um, and we sometimes um, don't kind of pan out enough to see some of the other things that are um, kind of at play beyond what's sort of immediately um, on our minds. Um, and so some of those, the impacting factors that are just important for us to be naming, um, what is somebody's age at the time that they're experiencing violence or at the time that they are presenting for services? Um, how do they identify? Um, and what, if any, details do we have about um, the identity of sort of who has caused harm to them? Um, what is their sort of overall mental health or trauma history? Um, are there other sort of places of insecurity or instability or um, kind of non-sexual violence-based trauma that are relevant? Um, do they have a support system? Um, is their family involved either in um, the harm they're experiencing or have they been made aware of the violence that this young person has experienced? Um, and what's their relationship to um, their offender? Um, all of those things are going to drastically change what makes someone feel unsafe, what um, might be their personal boundaries around what a supportive response would look like or not look like, what creates trust or distrust for them. Um, and it's just really important that we think about how many different combinations there are for those factors that are really driving how young people are perceiving our responses and if they would work for them or not. Um, the other thing to think about, um, there may no, be no um, physical force or physical evidence of violence, right, which can make it further complicated um, with some of these things around being believed. Um, it gets even more complicated when we include things like um, pictures or pornography or social media. Um, thinking about um, how, especially, are adults reading my behavior, right? Um, number one, are they noticing changes in my behavior? But two, are the things that they are offering as reasons for my behavior change or whether they are like appropriate or not, how are those matching with my experiences of myself? Um, and sort of, am I going to fill in the holes or contradict those narratives that adults are forming for me? Is that in my self-interest or not? Um, and that even more could be a very long conversation, um, but really the point of naming that is that we just have a lot of myths around what trauma responses look like. Um, and that, I would say, gets even more complicated when you're thinking about children and youth um, because there's a lot of 
um, expectations of how their behavior needs to be in different places um, and the different kind of environmental stressors that come um, with kind of having to be obedient all the time. Um, and that that can be its own sort of um, misconception that kind of distracts us from um, what it is youth might be responding to and showing us in their behavior. Um, so um, my background before getting into anti-violence work um, was really rooted in child and youth development. Um, and so these are some kind of starting assumptions um, that I want to kind of bring in as a follow-up to some of those unique needs and unique contexts that we were just um, starting to get into. Um, this, it uses the word children, um, but really you can think children and youth synonymously um, in this context. Um, the first thing is, first of all, just all humans really need feedback um, on their behavior, right? That we make decisions about what things mean, about what's expected of us, about how we should act in all kinds of situations based on environmental feedback. Um, and that begins um, at birth. Um, and the messages and feedback we get at birth become integrated into how we process future experiences. Because children are kind of starting at the beginning of that, right? They don't have as many um, like prior experiences to compare new experiences against. So they can internalize new experiences very quickly. And they can internalize them so quickly that adults may not even perceive that they've had an experience that they've drawn kind of associations with. And that kind of goes back to one of our big misconceptions, was, which is that if youth are experiencing trauma, we're going to know about it as adults, um, which nine times out of ten is just not true statistically. Um, and so just really thinking about the formative lessons that we are learning from these early experiences, that then by the time adults are responding, the impact of them misperceiving our behavior is also becoming a part of the narrative of what my trauma means to me and whether adults can be trusted in supporting me in those experiences. Um, and it gets even more complicated when you're thinking about the fact that youth need things from adults, right? Whether it's that they're not old enough to work and earn money for themselves, whether it's that, you know, they have some kind of condition where they're, like, not mobile, whether it is that, you know, you're the person who looks under my bed and makes sure that there's no monsters. Like, there's so many types of needs, but children and youth, by and large, know that as much as they are sort of learning about being independent and getting to do more and more things for themselves as they get older, they're aware that there are things that adults provide for them um, that they're dependent on, right, which makes it really complicated when they're thinking about how they are acting on sort of their distrust for us um, in supporting them or what consequences come from sharing information about them and possibly losing control of what happens next. Um, children also, you have to learn as a human to stop calling out contradictions and in information, right? So as a kid, you name everything, right? Like you will tell your babysitter you're doing bedtime wrong because you don't know the song to the, you don't know the lyrics to the song that somebody sings me, or you don't know the right amount of books to read me. And so like you're going to name that as just an observation, that this is different than that. And over time, we train each other that rules are specific to different people in different environments. And so that contradiction stops feeling so worth observing and worth talking about. But when you're thinking about especially like what grooming looks like or what survival responses mean 
based on where I am developmentally. Um, this is another place where um, there are a lot of perceptions that children and youth come to advocacy with that may not reflect what their experience or what our policies would be at all, but are very much being formed by how have I, how have I drawn associations of what I can expect from you based on my prior experiences and the experiences of my peers. Um, um, for those of you who are writing in the group chat, I will stop um, in a few minutes and, and open it up for questions again. Um, for those of you who have um, a background in child development, um, you're probably familiar with Eric Erickson. Um, and certainly this is not the end all and be all um, in sort of human or child development and um, framework, um, but it is a very um, concrete one. Um, so I'm just gonna offer this visual a little bit. Um, and I just wanna say sort of two things. Number one, like human development works as building blocks, right? So what we learn first enables us to learn something more sophisticated, right? So you have to learn to support your head before you can learn how to roll over, right? That like we really understand that with our physical development, but the same is true with kind of all areas of our development. And sort of what's the primary developmental task um, is different at different times in our life. Um, and so it becomes really important to think about what have I learned about the world, about other people, about myself, based on how my experience of trauma is preventing me from some of these other developmental um, tasks that are expected of me um, or are confusing me and how they're kind of blurring together and the meanings that my brain and body are making from them. Um, when you're thinking about, like, resistance from a young person um, or a lack of trust, you're also dealing with these really deep-seated um, experiences from childhood that um, may not feel um, like they match the information that the young person has provided us about what's currently going on, but might very much connect with, like, areas of trauma that are not what they're coming to us um, to receive services from, um, or that might give you information about what is driving other adult responses um, or other adult priorities as it relates to their choices. Um, and so I really encourage you to spend some time um, just learning about child development or stages of development and thinking about how that um, shows up um, and people's behavior and people's um, kind of different needs at different times in their life. Um, the term that I want to connect it to for our conversation, um, which is actually pretty new, which is kind of hard to believe, um, but it's this idea of developmental trauma. Um, we've only been using this word for about a decade, um, and the reason it's important is because prior to us giving it its own term, we were misclassifying lots of symptoms and lumping them under sort of mental health challenges or diagnosing trauma responses as um, sort of um, other sort of diagnostic terms. Um, and so this gave us the ability to look at children's experiences um, and the responses that they might have to them in a way that is under the banner of trauma the whole time, right? Um, and specifically, it's saying that experiences of trauma, especially in those first few years of childhood, create developmental outcomes from that trauma, right? They change your development in ways that are going to affect you over time. Um, and that is really important when we're thinking about 
um, youth because just like those first few years of life, to, um, there's like a lot developmentally happening. When you get to those years around puberty, um, there's a lot happening then too, right? That's another one of those like huge milestones in our life where we're doing a lot of learning and not a lot of years, right? Um, and so that kind of heightens the impact and the harm that trauma can have at those times in our life. So um, just kind of listing it out, um, these are some of the reasons that that developmental trauma point of view is relevant, right? It gives you information on how my brain is developing, um, the level of reasoning I have, what um, independent ability I have to meet different types of my needs, um, what attachment I've developed with different caregivers or different peers, um, and also just what my trauma responses um, might look like, right? Am I showing you through my play? Do I have more sort of um, verbal access and I can use my words a little bit differently to tell you about what's going on? Um, that all of those things are going to drastically change um, how young people engage in advocating for themselves and, and what signals adults might have um, that something's going on. I'm imagining that this is pretty familiar um, for fellow advocates, um, so I'm not going to belabor this slide, um, but often part of what is exasperating the distrust that survivors have of advocacy um, is a feeling of like that lack of self-sufficiency um, that is coming from this breakdown and their ability to know like what internal resources they have as well as to feel like they're able to engage those on a community level, whether that's formally or informally. Um, and so there's a heightened risk there's a heightened sense of threat in part because, you know, that's how crisis states work, right? They keep us in a place where our thinking is really cluttered and it's very difficult to kind of turn off that part of us as triggered to think through some problem solving um, and maybe more um, of a removed um, or emotionally distant way. Um, and that can especially be hard for young people um, because again, it's, something we get better at developmentally over time. Um, so shifting a little bit back into this idea of what does this mean for us as advocates and for the institutions we work for? Um, the first reason that it's relevant, um, our responses do not capture the diversity of examples um, that youth can present with, right? So just off the bat, what our systems are prepared to respond to do not even begin to meet the amount of violence that young people are confronting on a day-to-day -day basis and the simultaneous nature of that. And so it's just important for us to say that. Um, and that from their perspective, they might negate they might name that the experience of accessing support is another form of violence or trauma for them. Um, and it's not our place to um, replace their sense of what's real with them with what's real from our perspective. We don't, we don't get to undermine their perspective on what makes, safe, makes them safer, um, though certainly that is our instinct as adults. So to give you a, an example of what some of those various factors in terms of how a young person might come to us for advocacy, typically we think in three categories, right? Somebody makes a disclosure, you, you witness something, or you have a suspicion. Within those three categories, this is just an initial list of all the different types of variables that might be present, right? Is the disclosure coming firsthand? Is the disclosure being coerced in some way? 
how much time has passed, right? Um, did somebody um, tell you thinking it was secret and then they learned more about the process and then changed their mind about whether they would participate? Um, is the violence coming from a peer, coming from a stranger, coming from someone in a position of power over them? Does the young person agree with you on how you are labeling their experience? Or are we talking more about like age of consent, for example? Um, because that piece comes up a lot too. Whether the young person at the time that you're engaging with them experiences themselves as consenting or not, regardless of what the law says, um, that certainly makes a difference in how they're experiencing um, support or lack of support. Um, discovery, again, social media is changing the game on everything. Um, oftentimes, I get called into schools um, because there hasn't been a disclosure, but there's been footage of um, something caught on camera, um, or somebody has come in um, who wasn't directly involved, but is a friend of someone who was involved, um, or parents learn about something. Um, there is a rumor right, that all those examples, um, we have to be thinking. Um, I, I would even encourage to go sort of point by point and look at your institution. Am I prepared to respond to this, yes or no? Um, and I imagine the answer is not going to be yes to all of them um, because sexual violence is so diverse and we are constantly learning how to have enough resources um, to kind of stay ahead of it. Um, so boiling that down to why does sort of recognizing that additional diversity matter, this is, again, a rough list of some of the additional barriers that youth survivors face when they are accessing advocacy. Um, and you could certainly look at this list and say that some of them also apply to adults. Um, but what it looks like is still going to be specific for them. Um, and so again, I talked about confidentiality earlier, um, but really just this idea that they don't get to assume that they have it, um, that's a real difference from adults to young people. Um, whether or not they had information on what they could expect before they're in that situation, um, whether or not the system recognizes their priorities or not, um, whether or not um, you can offer them the like protections that are important to them. So, for example, if you know they're disclosing at a school, and the product of that is that um, the person they're saying caused harm is also going to be interviewed, and that's going to create ripples in their friend group. Their experience of unsafety might be totally wrapped up in, I don't want this to change my experience of my peers. And that might not be something we can offer them. Um, and so just thinking of some of that tug of war around, especially like non-physical aspects of safety, um, and, and how that, again, creates this tension in what is creating the resistance to the young person seeking support in the way that we are able and not able to, to offer it. Um, another piece that comes up, um, especially in the context of hotlines, um, young people don't trust systems, they trust individuals. And so the fact that they are learning how to not grow attached to a specific person, but they have to kind of trust the system to be consistent and how it treats them, that's a really big shift because it's not their lived experience, right? Oftentimes, two adults do not treat youth the same way, right? Even just thinking of if you're a middle schooler and you go to seven different classes during the day, what rules look like in each of those classes is not going to be the same. Um, and so, again, when we put people in the position of trusting what we say when it goes against their lived experience, that makes us less credible to them. So again, thinking of this very practically, 
what are the takeaways, right? Why does this matter? Young people want to know primarily these four things. They want to know what they can expect, right? So they tell me specifically who's going to be involved, who gets to make decisions, what comes from those decisions, um, and what's going to happen to information about me, right? Which feels really fair, right? Something super private um, and pretty life-changing in a lot of ways. Um, it's not unreasonable for anyone to want to know these things up front. And often our resistance is because we are nervous that it is going to um, change somebody's mind about coming forward. And again, we just really have to sit in what do we believe about consent? Because if we're saying that consent is for young people too, we have to be okay with the moments when they tell us no, and we have to trust that they have more expertise on themselves than we do. Um, and that might mean from our perspective that there are decisions they make that we didn't want them to make. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't have been their decision. Um, and I would just say kind of as a field, like that's a question we need to spend more time sitting in. So in terms of some like common pitfalls, this, these are some considerations on a specific advocate level, right? Transference and counter-transference, right? So what am I projecting and what am I absorbing from this interaction? Adultism. What are the places where I am privileging my adult perspective over the young person? Informed consent. How am I doing a better job of giving information up front, um, especially around things that the young person won't have control over? Um, safety planning, right? How am I giving access to alternatives to me? How am I encouraging the young person utilizing um, their own internal and peer resources beyond just sort of formal advocacy? And how can I help them think through some of that? Um, in vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, just how am I taking care of myself? Um, so again, some questions um, to drive some of your reflection on this um, are listed out here. Um, and a lot of it, I would say, can be boiled down to how do I build rapport? How am I as consistent and forthcoming as possible? Um, and how am I kind of yielding to the young person's priorities? before we get to places where that's no longer on the table, right? Where the policies are so rigid that we kind of have reached a point of no return. Um, something I tell schools, I think policies around mandated reporting should be visible and on flyers in your school. I think that you should know that information long before it applies to you. So, that's a natural kind of pivot into um, institutional accountability. Um, it really behooves you to know what are the policies and procedures in your organization um, and what are areas where actually the laws give you more um, freedom than maybe you realize, right? And particularly around the messaging of what the laws are or the training and information that you're giving people in advance um, there, there tends to be not a lot of guidance in the laws about what that needs to be, which means that we can be really creative as advocates in terms of kind of using that um, more proactively than maybe we have in the past. Um, this one comes up for me a lot. How are you comfortable with youth using services that are not you? especially if some of those other options give them more control than maybe you're able to give them. And so, for example, the youth that I work with, if they tell me something in person, I don't have the same kind of discretion as if they tell me on our anonymous hotline. And so thinking about what are the rules in different settings um, and how can that create 
some, some different um, discretion for the young person and different places to be made aware of what they can expect ahead of time. Um, there's opportunities to kind of use our community um, and, and get more comfortable kind of leaning in to those partnerships. Um, I would say one of the reasons we tend to not do that um, is because other community responses get a bad rap for whatever reason, and so we're distrustful of them, or we don't think that the young person will have as positive an experience, or that the service just doesn't exist. Um, and that that's usually a place where the level of emotion that we have leads us to kind of blur boundaries. Um, and so that's really where that transference and counter-transference and secondary trauma show up around how am I kind of getting caught up in the emotion I have that violence and trauma create a lot of experiences that cause harm, even in the uh, moments where you're trying to access support. I don't, I don't think it's our job to make to, to try to make trauma less traumatic, right? I think that sort of dishonors the nature of trauma. Um, and so in the moments when that is hard for us to sit in, usually it's because we haven't been as great at self-care. Um, so these um, next two slides are, are a little more anecdotal. Um, I'm going to go through them a little bit quickly um, just because I want to leave time for questions at the end. Um, so I said this a few times already, um, but for the purpose of um, naming a bias I'm making and how this information is crafted, um, I'm considering relationships that adult advocates have with youth survivors within this category of power over which means that the young person does not have as much decision-making and control as the advocate does, which means that we are differently held accountable to kind of creating safety in that relationship and transparency of information, um, and that that's what makes the difference between a power and abuse of power. Um, beyond kind of our position of advocates, the aspect of age that there is different eligibility requirements for different services, and age is usually used in policy language around what the response means um, and who carries that response out. So we just have to know what that is um, in the specific area um, and position that we're in. Um, I also said this earlier, it's important to know that asking someone to give you information in order to access services from you is going to feel like giving up power. It is going to take away some of their independent control of what happens next. Um, and we can acknowledge that and respect that that's a risk. Um, and finally, um, it might feel sometimes like having control and having access um, can exist at the same time. Um, and if that's the fear that someone is coming with, um, we also can't explain that away for them. We can give them more information to try to um, counter that perception, but we have to know that that's where they're coming from, and we have to have information um, that can respond to that fear. Um, sort of to echo that, um, kind of regardless of age, what young people tell me over and over is that they do not feel in control of decisions that affect them. Um, and this is kind of beyond just thinking about sexual violence, but just in general, they do not experience that they have control or respect from adults to make decisions for themselves um, during their day-to-day -day life. Conversely, the adults that I train who work with young people feel a lot of tension. They, they don't feel like they have all the training they need. They don't feel like the policies that they're bound to give them a lot of leniency. Um, they have a lot of strong emotions and desire to protect young people 
Um, and often they have a lot of feelings from their own childhood and adolescence um, that are influencing their sense of what is good for young people. Um, and finally, um, we just have to know what's true in the environments that we're a part of, right? We have to listen to what people are labeling as sources of trauma for them. Um, and that when somebody is making a decision between having control and having access, that often means that they are going to favor coping strategies that they can use without involving another person. And that's going to often mean that I'm covering up my coping mechanism and that I'm managing kind of ongoing crisis state um, kind of secretly. Um, and that those are often the moments where adults get involved because something in, those, in that style of coping has escalated or because it's, it's no longer secret, right, which already creates the stage that the advocacy is unwanted. So, again, takeaways, right? It is really important that we start thinking more creatively about how to support young people and that we are investing in community-based responses and peer-to-peer -peer support in spaces where confidentiality can exist for young people. Um, and where, just like adult survivors are asking for non-system responses, young people are asking, that, asking for that too. Which means there's also a lot of space to be engaging with families, to be giving different skills to adults who work with young people, um, and to be practicing offering different kind of communication scripts for young people and adults and how they can kind of build trust in their relationship and have more respect for where each, of the, where each other are coming from. Um, and finally, that there's a lot more overlap between prevention and advocacy than we think. And when you're encouraging sort of um, self-initiated advocacy, um, it often comes with arming yourself with more information and building skills that you can practice in your relationships, which is a form of prevention and, and violence prevention that then can change the culture in different places like your school or like your family. Um, and so that's another place where we can be um, really in relationship with preventionists and with um, other adults who have that skill set of, of youth development um, and who really buy in to this, this power with um, arrangement um, in our relationships with young people. Um, and so finally, um, in thinking about how do you spend more time building the skills and capacity that communities have to kind of control some of their own support needs, safety planning is your friend, right? How are you giving people the ability to think about problem solving on their own terms with their own boundaries kind of driving their options, right? And so everything from helping teachers think about how they um, design their classrooms and enforce behavior um, standards, um, to practicing like healthy relationships and, and consent skits from on a peer-to-peer -peer level, to knowing when like you're really angry and you're, um, you like need support and managing that feeling, right, before you kind of lose control of your response. Um, all of that is kind of this very broadly applied style of safety planning, which is about making, making um, what could otherwise feel involuntary more voluntary, so that you're leaning into the relationship building on the front end, so that by the time somebody is approaching advocacy, you already have some of that rapport and some of that transparent information out of the way. So. Um, there's a little more interest in hearing what they can expect from their process 
and maybe being interested in engaging it because I feel like you've treated me with respect and given me the information I need uh, to feel comfortable trusting you um, with what might otherwise feel like um, a really negative or really um, kind of disincentivized um, response from my perspective. Um, and so for the advocate side of that, um, this is just the checklist I offer you and thinking about how you are um, able to sort of not overstep young people's boundaries in the way that you're offering them advocacy support by just being conscious of these different areas. Um, so I'm gonna pause there um, and open it to questions. Um, what sort of rose to the top, Michelle? Yeah, you bet. Um, a couple of things. Um, Brandy asked, as an advocate working with youth, how do you handle the family counseling aspect? such as my mom doesn't understand because she has never been a victim and she keeps making me wash the dishes and clean my room. I get this a <laughs> lot and usually refer, to the, refer them out to a family therapist if it gets too tricky, but most of the time it is just, oh, it's just overwhelmed that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. What can I say to not sound like their mother? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, the first thing I want to just say, like on a structural level, one of the... Uh, weaknesses that we have in our advocacy is that most of our models come from a family framework. So there isn't a lot of independent support for young people outside of engaging their family. And so I think that already comes from a place of angst because young people are so used to their emotions not being taken seriously. And so the first thing that comes to mind when I hear that is like, what's the need behind the need? what is that an example of for that young person that this is just a less vulnerable example of? Um, and so that my first question to that is like on an institutional level, if there's a way that you want to redirect the young person, is there um, sort of a reciprocal redirect that you're going to offer to that adult to make it equitable? Um, the next question is, um, I work in higher ed and we work with a good number of freshman women. Do you have any thoughts about how to apply this to the 18-year-olds who are no longer minors but still may have similar thinking patterns as 17-year-olds? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I want to say is that um, effectively our implementation of um, campus response to, to college-age survivors effectively replicated mandated reporting. And so I would say that that's more than a thinking pattern. It is, in fact, uh, an institutional reality for them. Um, so also, again, to highlight community-based responses outside of that system's response, because it can, this is a system, um, I think, um, I often do trainings for um, like study abroad programs within um, universities um, and have helped them in the past come up with um, language that can be just displayed um, in dorms so that people, again, can know this information before they're, before they're in it. I think if it's such an emotionally charged time to be asking for help when you're in crisis, that if we can have these conversations outside of those um, like reactive moments, everyone's going to show up from a place of um, just like greater regulation, which is going to, one, make me remember what you said more, and two, help me ask more follow-up questions so that whatever barriers might be in the way for me, I can think through how to get around them or what alternatives I might use instead before I'm act actually seeking support. Which also, I guess, the one other thing I would say is, again, where this 
piece about having good partnership, partnerships with um, preventionists is really important is there's opportunities for us to be leveraging those training spaces um, to help people practice um, learning about some of these um, advocacy responses and, and how they might engage with them, um, even as we're talking about prevention of violence. Um, Amanda, I, I would also say one of the things that I think about too with that question is that I, I worked with um, an organization here locally that provide um, advocacy to um, street youth and youth that experienced a lot of trauma and also that, you know, just because somebody is 18 or even 23, they still benefit from a lot of the same advocacy uh, because of where they might be developmentally and how trauma impacts their development. No, I, I would say that's true. The one thing I might, the only thing that I caution about negating the structural reality in place of the sort of internalized behaviors that youth have in response to those is I feel like sometimes it diminishes those structural realities or focuses too much on young people just changing their feelings or changing their attitudes. Um, so I think from the perspective of inviting greater accountability and really taking the informed consent more to heart. Um, but I just, I, I stop short of feeling comfortable um, just not naming that those structural realities are also at play. You bet. Thanks, Amanda. Um, there's one final question that is kind of impossible to answer. This is, do you foresee a revision of mandated reporting laws to better reflect the confidentiality needs of older teens within the rape cri within rape crisis, crisis centers? Well, I have a lot of different answers to that question. And I will say, like, just for the sake of transparency, um, I, as Amanda, am significantly more comfortable um, with child and youth sort of agency than a lot of other adults I know. And so I think we're not going to get around just the lack of consensus that we have as an advocate community, let alone a parent community, let alone, you know, how our systems function. But what I will say we're asking these questions on smaller levels. And so there is um, legislation in D.C. that did um, offer an exception to mandated reporting um, in certain cases. And so I think we're going to continue to see it in that, like, piecemeal way. And certainly there's a difference between, like, what gets offered up legislatively versus what gets implemented. Um, but I don't know how you get to a place where we can change our response without first confronting that we need a, a more valid alternative to some of our um, child protection thinking. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we are, it's about seven minutes after, so we're gonna go ahead and um, wrap up. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Amanda. You're the best. Um, as a reminder, please fill out the short evaluation that you'll get by email. Um, and let us know if um, others were on the webinar with you, just so I can keep that for my reporting. Um, and you can email michelle at wixap.org. A recording of today's webinar and the materials will be posted on our website, that's wixap.org, under Recorded Webinars. Um, and you'll be able to access that usually within a week um, of this webinar. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for your participation today. Yes, I would.